Good evening, everyone. Please take your seats. We are going to start right now. Um, thank you very much for being here. My name is Aaron Halász. I work at the city of Budapest as a sustainable transit uh, specialist at the uh, Department of Climate and Environmental Affairs. And um, I'm very happy that you are here. And also, I, I would like to thank Erzsébet Város, the district municipality, which is, I think, the bravest so far in, uh, in traffic calming in this area. You could so see a lot of changes and they gave us this place so we can be here together. Um, Marika Stupi tell us how the Danes don't know that you cannot go to work or you cannot go to do your shopping by bike and how it happened and why is it like that um, and how they are managing this constant change of the city and uh, the redesign of, of city and how they manage the resistance. And I think this is a very key topic now in Budapest as well. Um, after Mari's presentation, we are going to follow with a panel discussion and I will introduce Adam Bodor, who is the uh, Director of uh, Mobility uh, Development at BKK and Ada Amon, who works at the City Hall, is the Head of the Climate Department. But first of all, I'm here to, um, I would like to introduce Mari, who is a strategic urban advisor at the Copenhagen-based consultancy company Urban Creators, and she helps cities uh, and national authorities, private developers, to create a cyclist and people-friendly city. And she is more into the human aspect of, uh, and, and also in the political, technical, and practical challenges of cycling promotion, and um, she has been the um, head of the bicycle program for eight years in the city of Copenhagen before starting her new job at the, uh, at the Urban Creators uh, Company. And um, I think it's enough from me. And Mari, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me all the way, way over here to uh, Budapest. I just flew in this afternoon and walked 20 minutes over here from the hotel. So uh, I still need to discover Budapest, really. Uh, and I'm looking forward. I'm also I'm staying here for two more days. So please uh, bear with me if I cannot uh, describe in detail the conditions here. But from what I've seen so far, it's a beautiful city. So uh, looking forward to, uh, to learn more about Budapest also during the discussion today. So I will mainly be uh, sharing experiences from uh, Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, from, uh, as uh, Aaron said, my 13 years working for the, for the bicycle program there. Um, and right now I work for Urban Creators, which is a consultancy firm working to help cities and states and regions become more sustainable and livable through mobility. I'm also the vice chair of the Cycling Embassy of Denmark, which is a public-private umbrella organization of 40 organizations working to promote cycling in Denmark and also internationally. So, how many of you have been to Copenhagen before? Okay, quite a lot of you. So, you might have experienced this like you see in the photo here. Copenhagen is often mentioned as one of the world's most cycle-friendly cities. We have around 700,000 residents and 1.5 million in the capital region. And when you look at all trips inside to from Copenhagen, it's around 26% that is being done by bike. And when we look at trips to work and uh, education in Copenhagen, it's 42%. So especially in the rush hour in the morning, you see a lot of bikes. Cycling is really normalized and mainstream. And so you might think, okay, so you have a lot of dedicated cyclists. We don't. If you ask any Copenhagener, do you identify as a cyclist with a capital C? They would say no. Just like all of you guys probably brush your teeth two times a day, but you don't identify as a toothbrusher with a capital T. 
So here you can see an opera lover and a heavy metal fan and someone who is really dedicated in politics, but they don't identify as cyclists. And when we do surveys asking why do you choose a bicycle, the environment does not score very high, even though everyone knows it's good for the environment. They say it's because it's easy, it's fast, doesn't cost much, and it allows for me to find the time to be uh, healthy instead of finding the time to going to the gym. Because even though you care about the climate, it's not in the morning when you're busy for work that you feel like saving the planet. So if we really want to promote green transport modes, we need to make them the easy choice, the practical choice, the time-saving choice, not just the idealistic choice. So the good news is, even though we have lots of cyclists in Denmark and in Copenhagen, it's not because Danes are more idealistic and environmentally minded than in Hungary or any other country, I would, I would suppose. It's because we made the right choice, the easy choice. So a proof of that is that you see the whole population cycling, from old people to really young people, and even in the winter when it snows, the cycle remains the practical and easy and fast mode. And it's really reliable. If you're a little bit late, you cycle a little bit faster and you get there in time. Whereas in public transportation or in your car, you can get stuck and you can't do anything about it. Cycling is so normalized that even fancy people in society bike. So this is our Lord Mayor, Sophie has told nothing. I regularly crosses her on the bicycle track in the morning when I go to my office and she goes to town hall. We have the Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen and even our Crown Princess Mary cycling with her children. And the reason we managed to make cycling for everyone, not just for the dedicated cyclists who will cycle no matter what, just like dedicated toothbrushes who will brush the teeth even though the water is dirty. No, if you want the broad population to cycle, you need to make the conditions attractive. Not just fast and practical, but it needs to feel safe. So safe that you are okay with cycling with your newborn baby. Because if you're afraid that you're going to get killed by a truck, you don't want to choose a bicycle as your daily means of transportation. So that's of course really important. And the feeling of safety, at least in Copenhagen, we have a lot of cars. Those of you who've been to Copenhagen have seen the cars, I'm sure. So we managed to make a bicycle city with still a lot of car traffic. If you go to Dutch or Belgian cities, you might see much less cars. But we have allowed for the coexistence of both a lot of cars and a lot of bikes. And it's only possible because we invested in dedicated bicycle infrastructure. So this is the standard Danish bicycle track, where we have a curb here. And again, here, separating cyclists from pedestrians and car drivers. And you see all the cars next to here. We have 380 kilometers of dedicated, physically separated bicycle tracks on each side of the street within the municipality. So that's the standard solution for larger roads. But before, this is a photo from the 40s. We didn't need the physical separation. As you can see, there are very, very few cars in the streets. The, cycle, the cyclists dominate the road. So here, we wouldn't actually need the dedicated bicycle tracks. And this is traffic countings from this very street. As you can see in the late 40s, we had between 50 and 60,000 cyclists per day. And now look at what happened in the late 70s, 8,000. So Copenhagen has not always been Copenhagen. Copenhagen is the product of political priorizations and citizens' opinions, etc. It can change over time. But the latest traffic count from 2020 showed that we had managed to reverse the trend. And now we count 42,000 cyclists in this street per day. 
I know that in 2016, when we had 48,000 cyclists, I checked with the Dutch and the Chinese, and there was no other street in the world where there was counted more cyclists. So why did it drop so much in the 70s? Well, in the 60s, we planned for an urban highway right through the center of Copenhagen, like in many other cities around the world. The car was the future. And there were huge public protests. The citizens did not want cars everywhere in their city. The highway was uh, approved, but we didn't have the money to build it. We were really poor back then, luckily for us today. But the municipality and the politicians, they also started listening to the citizens that had voted for them. And slowly started to prioritizing cycling in Copenhagen. Many things can be said about COP15, which was held in Copenhagen. It was not a huge success for the climate, but it raised a lot of awareness in Copenhagen about the need for green mobility. So we had a very visionary Lord Mayor and technical and environmental mayor who had this vision that we should really do better in cycling and we should be the world's best city for cycling and we should be CO2 neutral in 2025. So we had this bottom-up movement, but we also had a top-down vision from some visionary decision makers. And we made a bicycle strategy, we set up a bicycle program, that was when I was employed 13 years ago. And so the whole administration really started to accelerate investments and measures ranging from high-profile projects like car-free bridges for pedestrians and cyclists, dedicated green cycle routes, etc., but also integrating cycling in all the municipalities' work, making it free to bring your bikes on public transportation, um, making campaigns, putting up footrests and tilted garbage bins, and clearing away the snow in the winter, because all those details together make for the attractive experience that will make the large population cycle. So this is the street where I showed the traffic countings. This is today's situation. When we talk to citizens, they say, please don't make more people cycle because there's not enough space. It's too congested on the bicycle tracks. It's a nice problem to have, but we still need to progress further. This is my former colleague, Nils. He started working uh, in cycle planning in Copenhagen in the 70s. So that makes five decades of planning for cycling. He died three weeks ago. He was 73 years old. But he made this uh, graph of the kilometers of bicycle tracks over the last 100 years in Copenhagen. And as you can see, it's a linear graph. It's not like, it's just, Slowly and steadily, we've expanded our network. It has taken 100 years. So sometimes things does take time. But I'm hoping that many other cities will show Copenhagen that it can be done faster. We don't need 100 years. At least the climate cannot wait that long. The good news is that it's not rocket science, actually, to build a bicycle track. We can put people on the moon today. We can make self-driving Teslas and what have you not. It's basically a matter of prioritization. We need to prioritize the money, the space, and we need to re regulate. And I often hear cities coming to Copenhagen saying, oh, but we don't have the same budgets. We don't have the same space. Our streets are much narrower, or we cannot regulate. We don't have the legislation. And I tell them, show me one car infrastructure project or one public transportation project that is less expensive than a bicycle infrastructure project. Show me a transport mode except for walking that takes up less space than cycling. I know change is not easy, it doesn't come by itself, but it is a matter of prioritization. And for regulation, car parking, speed management doesn't necessarily cost a lot, it takes political will, but it's something that we can decide. How fast do we want our cars to go? How easily and how cheap can they park in our public space? But 
can we afford this? These are official numbers from the Danish Ministry of Transport. For one kilometer done by bike, society gains 85 euro cents. One kilometer by e-bike is 51 euro cents. And every time we drive one kilometer in a car, it costs society 15 euro cents. Oh, but let's switch to e-electric cars. That's much better. Still a cost of 14 euro cents per kilometer. Why is that? Well, for the bikes, Physical activity is a huge gain for society. Smoking is a new, sitting is a new smoking. We are not moving enough in our daily lives. We sit in our office, we sit in our car, and we are extremely expensive for society because we get cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, etc. And even with an e-bike, you get physical activity. And the cars, create congestion, traffic accidents, noise, air pollution, and CO2 emissions. And even for e-cars, the congestion and traffic accidents still cost society. One thing that can be difficult to monitorize is the access to public space. So the more demographic, demogra democratic aspect of uh, urban planning who has access to our streets if they don't have a driver's license or cannot afford public transport. And in the street I showed you before with the 42,000 cyclists, there was a debate 15 years ago that we had the double number of cyclists than cars, but the cars had all the space. So the politicians decided to make a big transformation in the beginning, it was a trial where the middle of the street was only allowed for buses, so you could access the rest of the street with a car, but you could not go from one end to the other in a car. And then we had the bicycle tracks, which were widened in the most busy street, part of the street, and the sidewalks were also widened. So we actually took out two out of four car lanes so we reduced the space for cars with 50%. And this is uh, the head of the merchants union. He had a, a paint shop and he was so critical. And he claimed that all the shop owners were against this. Although there were many shop owners who were just curious, but he got all the media coverage and he was very loud and very critical. But what the politicians did, they made a survey with all the local res residents, not only in the street, but also in the surrounding area. And I think it was 56% who were positive for the trial, and around 25% who were against it. So they said, okay, let's make this permanent, even though the shop owners, some of the shop owners don't like it. And uh, then it was made permanent, as you see, so now we have four meter wide bicycle tracks in each side of the street, only two car lanes with buses, very wide sidewalks as well. And, uh, and of course car traffic went down quite a lot, cycling went up, walking, bus passengers more or less the same. And if you put all the numbers together, no matter what transport mode you're in, we actually managed to increase the total number of users in the street by 20%. So maybe for the persons buying 10 liters of paint, it's not so practical because maybe they needed a car. But for all the other shops, they actually saw an increase in potential customers of 20%. And then look at this, people who chose to stay and hang out in the street exploded before you just go from one end to the other, because there was so much noise from the cars, you could not have a conversation. Now you could actually hang out in this street. And it's become one of the most hip places to enjoy the sun in Copenhagen. And it can be hard to monetize the value of urban space, but this street has fundamentally changed its essence from being a transport corridor to being a destination in itself. 
And some years ago, the city of Copenhagen did this uh, survey about who buys what in the street level shops in Copenhagen. And this is Danish billion crowns per year, but it showed that cyclists actually spend a little less per shopping visit, but they shop more frequently, and the total turnover was larger than what the motorists would spend in the shops. And if you see the total amount of the turnover, the motorists make up a minority of uh, the economic value in street level shops. In Copenhagen we have a harbour in the middle of the city and some years ago we made a public-private partnership around the green cycle route around the harbour because we saw that museums, hotels, bicycle rental companies, kayak clubs, etc. could see the value of promoting a recreational cycle route and draw attention to the fact that you can enjoy the city in another way by foot or by, by bike. So that's another way the city is working with local stakeholders to really promote cycling, because uh, municipalities can make nice campaigns, but often it reaches a wider audience if you collaborate with local stakeholders. We've also recently set out a fund for local residents to transform their streets into green urban streets. This is a trial we did with some residents where they were offered a mobility service package and then they could not use their car for a month and we would take out the car parking in front of their building and turn it into a pocket park. It was quite difficult to convince them not to use the car, but they did not want to let go of the pocket park. They could really see the value of the, the, the public space not just being taken up by parked cars. And this was on the basis of a drone analysis showing that over 25% of the cars on the street would sit still from Monday to Friday. It's so cheap to park that you could have a car and not use it. But it takes up a lot of space in your residential street. We've also asked citizens where in the city parents and school children don't feel safe going to school. We got 13,000 pins in this map and where we need more bicycle tracks or wider bicycle tracks, etc. We've got 10,000 inputs on a map. So even in Copenhagen, it's not like, we're the best city in the world. Our job is done, we can go on vacation. We still have work to do. And this really speaks very clearly where we need to focus that work. And then, citizens are often viewed as being critical, difficult, negative, especially citizens who show up at public consultation meetings. So to change that dynamic, we set up what it's called a citizen committee, and their job was to qualify how we can reduce car traffic in the medieval center of Copenhagen. So 36 citizens were chosen statistically, representing all political parties, men, women, different incomes, some had a car, some did not. But their goal was to make a unison decision recommendation for the local politicians. They had to agree, all 36. And then they had access to all the experts, all the knowledge, all the data. And they ended up recommending a 70% reduction of car traffic and up to 90% reduction of car parking, street level car parking. And they agreed. So if you give the citizens the right context, they can actually be both courageous and constructive. This is the mayor of Chicago, Emmanuel Rahm. When he came into office, he was contacted by some of the big tech companies. And they said, if we have to attract really highly educated workforce, you need to make better bicycle conditions. So that's what our future employees want. So please help us relocate to your city, but you need to do your job to make it a more attractive city. And then he said to the city administration, 
I want a bicycle dragon one month. And they were like, no, 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 it takes three years. It cannot be done. But he was really insisting. And then they implemented like completely crazy speed projects. Maybe they had to redesign it a little bit afterwards. But it goes to show that if there is pressure from the local community and an ambitious politician, and maybe also an administration who's willing to take some risks, you can make change. A municipality is not an island. A lot of the traffic will cross municipal boundaries. So in Copenhagen, in 2009, we funded the Super Cycle Highway collaboration. It started out with, I think, 10 municipalities. Now we have 30 municipalities in the Copenhagen capital region collaborating on building high-level commuter routes in the whole region. region. And this is from a mayor summit with the, the participating municipalities handing over a declaration to the Danish Minister of Transport, former Minister of Transport, with some recommendations. And here we have all the different political parties. We have suburbs, we have city centre, we have rural municipalities coming together, but this is the result of 10 years of coordination and collaboration. At the end, I think it's really important to have a positive and constructive approach. So at least in Copenhagen, we try to bring in humor to some of these discussions that can be really tough sometimes, talking about taking out car parking or the climate, etc. This is from a bike to work campaign, it says, Go on, you can eat the cake, you bike to work, it's so healthy. So uh, bring in a little humor, a little joy, and some constructive uh, suggestions, and I think uh, the future is bright, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. Szeretném megkérni a kollégákat, hogy segítsenek itt felrakni a székeket és asztalokat. Uh, and meanwhile, we are putting up uh, the tables and, and before I invite Adam and Dada, I would like to ask you, um, there is a debate about Copenhagen and Amsterdam. And there is a huge fan group of Amsterdam who say that Copenhagen is not good enough and Amsterdam is better in segregation or separation. And, um, and what is, what's your take on this? In general, I would say that in, uh, in Denmark and in Copenhagen, we really like to segregate. So we have the cars here, we have the bikes here, the pedestrians here, the whole shared space things. We are not so comfortable in that. And when you look to the Netherlands and Belgium, they reduce car traffic more, they reduce the speed more, and so you don't have this urgent need to segregate. Um, so that, that's another take. I, it's two different approaches. Um, and to some extent, traffic calming is called the invisible infrastructure. It can be really effective. Um, but in some such situation, I would like to have my own space, actually. And it can um, be difficult, for example, for children to navigate in like very complex traffic situations. Um, also, it's a very interesting thing to me to see that there's a bicycle program uh, in the city of Copenhagen. Can you tell us where is it in the administration and what role it has, how many people it works with? When I was employed in 2008, it was called the Bicycle Secretariat because we had this mayor who really wanted to do things. Um, I've been there for many years under different organizational structures. We've been between 7 and 13 staff. So the bicycle program is in charge of the strategic planning, communication, behavioral campaigns, and coordination. So a very important task is making sure that cycling is integrated in the whole administration's work, from traffic signal regulation, how much green light do we give to cars or buses or cyclists, or pedestrians, winter maintenance, uh, yeah, you name it to have this holistic approach. So a lot of coordination. When we renovate the street surface, maybe we can put in a bicycle track. It's much less costly than if we were to only build the bicycle track, etc. 
Um, you wrote in your thesis um, the role of cycling in the national identity of Denmark. Um, can you shortly introduce it to us? Where is it in the national identity? Yeah, so I'm actually not an architect or an engineer. I studied modern cultural studies, and I wrote a thesis on the relation between Danish national identity and everyday life. The cycling is a case. It's not that cycling is particularly Danish. We imported it from the UK back in the late 1800s. Um, but at least in Denmark, culturally, the bicycle is seen as something very democratic. It's for everyone, it's very human, and it ensures that you stay grounded because you are eye level with everyone. If the Lord Mayor sits inside his car in a metal box, he's not accessible. So it's like a, a symbol of the democratic society where everyone can meet each other freely. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'll, I would like to introduce Ada Amon and uh, Adam Bodor to the stage, and please take your seats. Thank you very much, Adam, and I'd love to uh, accepting this invitation. What's your first impressions on what we heard? I mean, thanks a lot for the, for the opportunity uh, to be here today. It's always great to hear about uh, what is going on in Copenhagen. I was there, I think, and we were discussing 13 years ago. And it, it was really, really impressive uh, to see the amount of cyclists and the great quality of the infrastructure. But what strikes me is that you still find new and new things to be developed, because 12 years ago or 13 years ago it looked perfect for me. Uh, but I remember you were already planning at that time new and new uh, projects. And you mentioned at the end, okay, can I have questions as well? Of course. And then also sorry, um, sorry. after like 20 or 25 minutes you will open up the discussion to the audience as well. Please. Yeah, so you mentioned the super city stiller or whatever in Danish, the, the super cycle highways, uh, which are connecting the suburban areas with the city. So if you could elaborate a little bit, uh, how many percent of the traffic in Copenhagen is coming from the suburbs? Because this is one of our biggest challenges as well. And what is your objectives? How many percent you would like to switch into sub super cycle highways, super city stiller? So I don't have the specific model share of how many, how large a pro proportion of the total number of trips is from uh, from the outside and in. But I know that if we look at traffic counts coming in and out of the city centre, we have cyclists slowly overtaking the number of cars. So in recent years, we have had more cyclists crossing the city centre than cars. But then when we look at the municipal border. We have around seven times more cars than cyclists. So the number of cars has stayed the same or increased a little bit, and the number of cyclists has also increased quite a lot with the cycle superhighways. But we still see these differences. And of course, it's the regional way, uh, regional roads and the highways that bring in a lot of cars. Um, this year, we will be opening five super cycle highways. So it takes a long time to find the financing when you have to collaborate maybe seven different municipalities along a, a cycle super highway. And we normally say, imagine if highways or train rails were financed like this, that every municipality had to find their own money for their bit of the train rail piece. And you would have to wait for everyone to find that money. So uh, fortunately, the Danish government has set aside some public funding that municipalities can apply for, and then they would fund between 40 or 50 percent of the total cost. So that's very important, especially for the super cycle highways, because it's an extra, extra motivation to join this collaboration. And often it's a mix of existing infrastructure and then upgrading the missing links along this route. Okay. Another interesting fact is that when we look at 
the person's using the cycle superhighways, the average trip length, so how far do each person cycle on average, is 13 kilometers. So people are actually willing to cycle quite far if the conditions are good. What they say is that, yeah, it maybe it's, it's not faster than taking the car, actually, for these longer trips. But I don't need to go to the gym two times a week. So instead of looking from A to B, you look at from some, you look at the whole week, how much time do I spend in the whole week? And I get to get a little me time on my long commute. And then we try to organize it together with the regional train system so that maybe you can go 13 kilometers in the morning and take the bike and the train home. So it's not 26 kilometers in one day, it's only one way you take the bike. Or if it starts raining, you can find a station along the route and then change your mind. So have this flexibility, not thinking only cycling or public transportation, but to try to integrate the modes. Yeah, um, <clears throat> just a few days ago, Adam, uh, uh, Aaron, uh, I'm mixing oh. names here, Aaron uh, um, told me that the, that the cyclist friendliness of a city can be measured by the slowliness of, or the slowness of, of the driving uh, uh, bike. And then it, while you were, you know, giving this presentation, it, it came to my mind that I have a friend in Copenhagen, even, and she drives her 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 bike like crazy, crazy slow. And it was I wasn't worried that she would fall because it, it doesn't really have a pace. So yeah, I think it is. Uh, it makes sense, but obviously everybody who who gets on a on a on a mobility facility or object, uh, people would love to, you know, get good speed. And this is a this is a phenomenon what I tend to see in Budapest as well. And whenever I get on my on a, on my bike, I I want to be fast. Yes. And so how, and, and probably it's also, uh, so this is one, you know, response and, and would love to hear your, uh, uh, yeah, reply on that. The other thing is, um, what do you think, how much, how, what is the share of cyclists would work <laughs> at critical mass, what would turn around the, they call critical mass, of course, the, 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 the annual cyclist um, event when we demonstrate that we love, we would love to, to get on bikes um, more and more. So what do you think, what, what would be the, the, the critical mass of bikers in a city? What would change, would be a game changer in, a, in this sense? Well, to start with the last uh, remark or question, when I looked into the bicycle account here from Hungary, I found it rather unusual that the cycling modal share in Budapest is lower than the rest of the country because often when you have cities, it's more dense and you have shorter distances. So cycling is usually higher in the cities and lower in the rural areas. So here is the other way around. So I think Budapest has many good advantages and possibilities to increase cycling even more. But as, as I understand, you also have high levels and good quality public transportation, which is very good. I mean, in some ways, cycling, walking, and public transportation should complement each other and not be each other's uh, um, enemies. So maybe the mode share of the car is actually the interesting part. And at least in Copenhagen, the car takes up 31% of all trips, and the goal is to reduce it to 25%. But it's difficult to find the political courage to really not only please the green modes, but also do things that makes it more costly or more difficult to be a car driver. 
So right now, a huge project is being put into place where we reduce the traffic speed on almost all roads by 10 kilometers an hour. So normally, urban streets are 50 kilometers per hour, and that will be 40 kilometers. Do you have resistance on that? I don't think people have really realized yet what will be going on. No, but actually, I think many residents would like to see a more calm traffic. All the streets where we have done traffic calming measures, everyone is like taking it for granted now. No one wants to go back to the noise and the speed and the feeling of not being safe. For your question about the speed of cyclists, the average travel speed for cyclists in Copenhagen is 16 kilometers per hour. When we have Dutch cycling experts visiting us, they find that we go really fast. We have this, we're on a bicycle track, we almost copy the cars, you know? It's really efficient and you go in your morning commute and you don't want to get delayed and if there is a tourist, you ring the bell going ding, ding, ding. So, it's, it goes to show that we've managed to create this effective transport system that is competitive with the car. For smaller children, it's maybe not optimal, so this is a debate we have. Do we have peaceful enough cycling conditions for the slower cyclists, also with electric bikes, etc.? I would still say that it's better that we have the fast cyclists than the cars, but they mix the same space, so how do we deal with that? In cities with less normalized cycling culture, you will have the dedicated cyclists who will bike no matter what, and they might go really fast and be a little bit hazardous. So it's difficult to generalize, I think. Is slow good, is slow bad, is fast good, is, is fast bad? It really depends on the context. We've, met, we've tried out uh, fast lanes and slow lanes on our bicycle tracks because we also have the cargo bicycles that take up quite a lot of space so to help the bicyclists know where to place themselves. In one and then, yeah. a, a last comment, it's not only about the speed you travel, but it's about the duration of the whole journey. So for example with traffic lights, if you make cyclists wait less time in front of a red light, they don't need to bike that fast if they want the same route to be uh, shorter. Or if you build a bridge across the river only for cyclists, then you can create a shortcut without the cyclist having to be really fast. Adam, please, you, you want to react? Yeah, to yes, I just realized in Copenhagen that you have a green bay optimized yes. uh, for this 16, 17, or 18 kilometers no, per hour. Actually, in the morning rush hour, if you bike 20 kilometers per hour, you hit the green wave because we wanted to give an advantage. So if you, it, it enables you to travel a little bit faster than and, the average. And I must say, I was cycling there once and it was snowing. And it's, I, I, I was thinking I'm a fast cyclist. I was a bit scary to go with 20 <laughs> kilometers per hour to get the next uh, green light on, on, in the snow. So I, I, and I learned that, is it true that the Copenhagen cyclists are more afraid of other cyclists than from car drivers. I read it somewhere that it was a survey. Is uh, it, is, could you confirm it or is it? No, I can't confirm it directly. Um, and of course, like getting hit by a truck is more serious than getting hit by another cyclist. But uh, yeah, but when we have these congestion issues in the bicycle tracks, of course, you get overwhelmed a little bit. You feel that the cyclists are a little bit challenging. But then again, the bicycle tracks only take up around 8% of the total street space. Car parking takes up 12%. So we are maybe not providing enough space for this many cyclists, even now. Um, I saw there was one slide in your presentation about the demonstrations in the 70s. Yeah. Um, you never had such radical acts like smashing up cars, not even in, in the 2000s, in the early critical mass years, but um, do you think it takes 40 years to, to completely change the city, or what, what was the, um, the big step forward when the citizens' movement, uh, citizens' movement's uh, goals became the, the policy of, of Copenhagen? So as I tried to show, this was an organic movement that took many decades, What's interesting, I think, for the mass demonstrations back then is that there was an oil crisis. There was not enough supply for oil and the 
Danish state had to uh, make car-free Sundays because there was not enough gas for the population. We had the economic crisis in the 80s where a lot of people were unemployed and the city almost went bankrupt. And then there was the environmental movement with acid rain and nuclear threats, etc. And there are some similarities to the situation today, I think, with the, the gas prices rising. We saw what the financial crisis was doing 10 years ago, and also uh, the climate emergency. And what was significant back then with the demonstrations is not, that it was not just the hippies or the left-wing young persons. It was the whole population, also the old ones, also those voting right-wing. It was really like integrated in the population. So is it, uh, but is it like the Danish democratic institutions who take up the leads from these kind of demonstrations and they start to debate it or there were like I, some people who really turned this around? I've talked to British uh, researchers and they find evidence that there were similar demonstrations in many other European countries at that time. So it's not unique to Copenhagen or Denmark, it was part of that period. But I think what really helped us was that we didn't have enough money to actually construct a huge highway right in front of the city, tearing down uh, historical buildings, etc. So we, we do have some big roads for cars, but it could have been much worse. So again, the argument that we cannot afford to transform our city, well, sometimes the cheap solutions are actually <laughs> what can save you, because car infrastructure has the highest budget. Always. So now we have too many similarities, so I will have to ask Ada and then Adam about them. Actually, if you are looking for cheap solutions in the city, you will find some. Uh, <laughs> we, we are also lacking finances, and I, I, I believe we have similarities. Also, regarding uh, the gas, not only the prices, but the supply, we might face, uh, especially in Hungary, a shortage of, uh, of gas, so it might give the push. Uh, I hope uh, at least for, if it's, it's a bad thing, but it can help uh, us in this case. But uh, going back to the, the finances, we are absolutely seeing a similarity. Uh, we, need, we, we need to make decisions about uh, tearing down or renewing certain flyovers, which will cost a lot to, to reconstruct. Uh, if we tear them down, it's much cheaper and it's a radical change. And as you mentioned, financially, it's much easier. The question for us is to get the public support for these measures, uh, because, of course, it needs a radical change in the behavior of the people as well. So that's, uh, that's our very how big the steps could be. I saw in your presentation it was a 100-year-long ladder or 100-year-long climb. Uh, so what do you think, how, how much faster it can be? Uh, we would prefer to go a bit faster. I think it's definitely uh, possible to go faster if you look to cities like Paris. I mean, France, the French, my husband is French, they love their cars. It's not that the French don't have a strong car culture. But inside Paris, a lot of locals, they don't own cars. And they have done massive, a massive transformation in the last five years, uh, accelerating with COVID. I recently went to Brussels which is, they have a lot of cars. But they are also moving quite fast now with 30 kilometers per hour zones, putting in bicycle infrastructure where they need it, etc. So change is definitely possible, also much faster than what we have seen in Copenhagen. For the, for the public support, sometimes it's a question about how you frame it. For example, the, the financial aspect, it's difficult for the pop population to really understand how things are financed and all the hidden costs of car infrastructure. Um, and I think there are many residents who may not be very vocal, but who will support a more livable city. Um, so it's also about giving all the passive supporters a voice and visibility. I would like to ask Ada about the possibilities of uh, the city hall now, because we heard a lot of um, similarities and also some aspect that Adam just brought up? I mean, it, it is a must, right? I mean, we have a very 
we have a climate urgency, which is uh, one of the first, or not the first, it probably was the first uh, announcement or, or decision what the, the council made, uh, this council made. Um, and uh, we have a new climate strategy which prioritizes uh, model split uh, very much so. Um, and uh, since now, at the moment, we have about a third of our emission or the city's emission coming from transportation. You would think probably it's higher, but no, it's about 28, 29 percent at the moment, but obviously this is one of the one of the ambitions which is growing, uh, which is still growing. Uh, and uh, we would have our emission reduction, uh, or fifth, one fifth of our emission reduction coming from transportation, modernization, new ways, uh, and actually prioritizing the active mobility uh, and and uh, and refurbishing or modernizing uh, public transportation obviously but but cycling as a mode of transportation is obviously one of our priority at least at the department of climate and environment <laughs> is to be frank <laughs> and according to the to the bicycle account of the survey, was it one third of Budapest residents who said that they were interested in cycling more if the conditions were better? Two thirds. Two thirds. And one third of them would definitely cycle, and there are uh, a huge amount of people who can uh, imagine themselves being on a bike, but right now they can because they you know. Uh, taking their kids to the school, but maybe after they, they flee or they can um, go along, they would uh, change to bike if the infrastructure would de uh, develop. So on the 20 minutes walking trip from my hotel to here, I saw a guy in a suit cycling on a public shared bike. I saw a mother with her son cycling on the sidewalk. I saw a cargo bicycle delivering parcels. I saw quite a lot of regular person cycling, not just, you know, hipster guys on the fixie. So I think you have really, like, it seems like on a cultural level, there, there is, like, the beginnings of a really mainstream bicycle culture. So I think the foundation is there. But the, yeah, but the conditions... Hungary, in Hungary as such, Hungary is a, a cycling country. country. But rather in the countryside, uh, but in the city it is it, it's a bit uh, controversial, I guess, right. at the moment. Yeah. Actually, the average level of cycling is pretty close to Denmark, if you look at it as a country. Right. Uh, so we are. But now we are talking about Budapest. We are so. talking about Budapest. So in Budapest, it's we are unfortunately far away. But what my comment would be. Is connected what you just mentioned regarding the share of cars in the model speed because what i saw from your figures i have my, my our figures in my hand that uh, instead of having a high uh, share for public transport you have a relatively low share compared with, with budapest uh, so uh, some people are worried if we promote more cycling it, it, it might goes on the expense of public transport even my own colleagues my company is mostly dealing with running and my department as well, running public transport. So what would you, what would you say to them? Uh, was there any threat, uh, was it perceived as a threat in, in, in Denmark? We also had those discussions like sometimes, but not as frank. <laughs> but all evidence shows that once people buy a car, they will use it, and they will often use it more than they had originally planned because it just sits there and now it's bought, so why not use it even for the small trips under five kilometers? So the more we can enable a car-free lifestyle that makes it possible to not own a car, maybe share a car once in a while or rent a car if you need to go further away, and you cannot do that by cycling alone, you cannot do that by public transportation alone, you need a mix of transport nodes. So I think 
if we really want to create good green alternatives, we need to look at multimodality. I also think that cycling can be very attractive on your way to the public transportation because the catchment area is much larger. If you look at the time the whole trip takes, it's really expensive to shorten the duration of the time you spend inside the tram or the metro or the bus or the train. But if you can shorten the amount, the amount of time you spend walking to the public transportation by using the bike instead, then it's much more attractive. So I really think the, the two should not compete as such. But it is, it is, of course, a possibility that some of the cyclists you create will be former public transportation users, which gives you more capacity in your congested public transportation. So that's, that's another way to look at it. And then from a democratic point of view, if we can provide really cheap, healthy mobility for some of the low-income groups, I think that should be a priority, honestly. So it's good that you mentioned some concerns in the transport company. I would like to bring up another one, which is um, quite a big debate now, is the public opinion. Um, how is it in Denmark or in Copenhagen? Um, the politicians, they are visionary enough or they are looking at the public opinion polls or are they reading comments on Facebook and then uh, making decisions? How do they deal with them? So. I think 10 years ago already we made a survey amongst car owners in Copenhagen. So not just average Copenhageners, but Copenhageners who own a car. And we asked them, how would you feel if the municipality actively restricts car traffic? 69% said that they were positive or very positive. Only car owners. And of course, it's not always the case if it's in their street and their parking spot, they, they, will, they might be are, pretty Are they good. using the cars regularly or they just have it at home? These were persons who own a car and use it. We don't know how much. So it just goes to say that for the singular car driver, it might even be an advantage that the others drive less because then you have less congestion and your kids have less air pollution and less traffic accidents, etc. Do you have new data on this? Because the change would be very interesting if there is I think is it's any. more or less the same, if not even more pronounced with the climate uh, consciousness. Um, are the politicians visionary? Good question. Uh, we have a, also a very ambitious goal to be CO2 neutral in 2025 already. And the transport emissions have not gone down. Like building emissions going down, a lot of other technical fixes for transportation stays the same. So the municipality has analyzed ways to really cut emissions from transport. So some very radical scenarios, blocking major roads for thoroughgoing car traffic, making car parking really expensive, etc. And the compromise they could find was to reduce traffic speeds to 40 kilometers per hour, which would, was estimated to give some reduction of emissions, but not the most radical scenarios. And which measures are the most difficult or, most, or, the, or the easiest to make? Well, I think every time you take away something from someone, it will be criticized. So of course, if you take out a car lane in order to buy, build a bicycle track, or if you say, this road we put in a modal filter, you cannot go the whole way by car. Or if you make it more expensive to park your car, or more difficult to find a car parking space, it will meet criticism. That is to be expected. Um, it's a sign that you have citizens who actually care about their so, city. So what is the part when you, when you intervene? You start very transparent from, from the beginning, or, or they usually like to you know, see the resistance and then like coming up with some campaigns or, or some other solutions. It's, it depends. We don't have one solution for everything, but like major shopping streets, if we want to do a large makeover like the one I showed you here, we will do a large public consultation with workshops with local stakeholders and maybe even have a small booth in the street for a month where passers-by can give their opinion. So, you know, very proactive citizen consulting. But for smaller streets where maybe a bicycle track being put into place, 
the politicians will decide for themselves. And, uh, and they represent different neighborhoods in Copenhagen, so that's, that's really also local politics. What's the local support in that particular neighborhood? And how do you distribute the money and the budget negotiations between the neighborhoods, etc.? So, um, my, and my question would be, do you involve the politicians into those debates? I'm asking this because in this city, actually, we had a pretty heated discussion about reallocating public space on one of our major boulevards. I'm talking about the Nutke for the Hungarian audience. Uh, so political figureheads got pretty strongly involved and it became a party political debate instead of a debate. So do you, do you involve the politicians or you keep, try to keep them away from these kind of debates and you involve other public figures instead? So what kind of, or, or they are involved and they are able to stay civilized? It, we did not manage it here. In so uh, no, we involve the politicians. I think it's, it's, it's extremely important that they also feel confident about the projects. And uh, sometimes, they involve themselves personally and invest political capital in a project, knowing that it's risky and it takes courage. And sometimes it's important for them to know that everyone will agree on it. It also depends on the alliances they have and how many votes they have, etc. So it depends, I would say, from year to year how the process goes. But in general, we involve the politicians a lot. And the citizen committee I mentioned, where it was the citizens who got the task of defining the recommendations, that was because the mayor wanted to do it that way. Uh, yeah. Is there a political, um, so you said it's not a green or lefty issue, right? Um, how are the political parties um, against or uh, pro-cycling? So our bicycle strategy, which has the goal that 50% of commuter trips to Copenhagen should be by bike. That was adopted by all political parties. And every year we have the budget negotiations and the administration proposes a lot of really good cycling projects, hoping that the politicians will uh, dedicate money to them. And uh, normally around 10 million euros is always allocated to cycling. But depending on what political parties can agree on the budget, it can be more or less um, redistributing space from cars. So if you have more a right-wing uh, majority deciding on the budget, it might be the bicycle tracks that will not be in the city center with a lot of cyclists, but maybe less traffic uh, streets because then we don't need to touch the car parking or, <laughs> or the car lanes. It's a little bit more compromise, whereas if it's a left-wing uh, majority, it might be more radical solutions. But it really depends also on the specific project and how we uh, describe it. Although you, you uh, sorry, just, I saw that Alda grabbed uh, her microphone. Yeah, I just, just, I just stronger wanted, and I just wanted to say that uh, we are also planning to, to involve the public into these discussions and uh, probably this uh, fall there will be a, a major citizens assembly dedicated to transportation and uh, well, air quality uh, enhancement rather than, um, I mean, we would probably focus on on uh, the quality of air and uh, so what i was reframing as a question to you is that what do you think what what is more appealing to to city uh, city people air quality or what is funkiness or uh, faster transportation or i mean i haven't Really, I, I don't know why Budapest, I mean, the Budapest bikers are choosing their bike, really. I don't know whether they want to skip one uh, gym of a week or, or, or why. Uh, in the service, it says that it's fast and free, and, 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 and also they, they regard highly the, um, the environmental effects. 
So um, sometimes I say that it's, the bicycle has too many advantages for its own good because people get confused and it's almost too good to be true. It's so healthy, it's so good for public health, but it's also really good for the environment and the air pollution and the congestion and the quality of public space. And I was like, but then what's the agenda, you know? It gets blurred because there are so many positive arguments. But I, I, I think it's difficult just to say, oh, it's, it's just the congestion, or it's just the air pollution. It depends on the context, and you need to be ready to bring out the right argument for the right context. I'm sorry about all the nice advantages, but there are so many. <laughs> so before I open up to the audience, there, I have one last question to you um, about the, uh, the previous topic. You, when we talked on the phone, two weeks ago, you said something about uh, bureaucratic leadership or entrepreneurship, which is very helpful. What does it mean? I don't know if there is a manual in the bureaucratic leadership or entrepreneurship, but um, being a, a modern culture uh, candidate myself, I never imagined I would work for a city administration. And uh, I find it interesting to see how you can work from within the system and really use the incredible power there is in local government. Because this is where change is happening. It's not on a national level often. Ministries work on a very general level. It's on the local level where you can actually change people's everyday life. So that's super fascinating. And often city administrations they have a lot of resources and a lot of power. Maybe they don't have the budgets up front, but then they have maintenance staff, or they have, I don't know, in our city we have parking controllers who give out parking fines. Mm -hmm. and they are out in the street, and they can also uh, help make sure that the cars don't park on the bicycle lanes. So really trying to see how can we work from within the administration and try to prioritize cycling in all the different daily tasks not only the big visionary projects that you need as well, but also integrated in the way you try. And this takes some entrepreneurship, takes some willingness to try to do things in another way than you're used to. Did you have to fight a lot to push through the system, some, some of your initiatives? A few fights and a lot of coffee and a lot of meetings and a lot of good positive energy because that's how you win people over in general. It's not by shouting at them, but sometimes you also need to put your foot down and say, no, this is too much. Okay, so um, I won't take away the microphone from you, um, but I would like to open up the discussion to the audience. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, and maybe in English, because now there is a Füles el, úgyhogy Orsi majd uh, tanácsol neki. Lehet, vagy Hát majd hogy nem muszáj, csak jelentkeztél. Uh, mondok magyarul, akkor végcsörű. Kagó Karmás vagyok a mozgási áttól. Uh, I can say it in English. Saying it in English? Okay. Yeah, something? it's okay. So there has been a debate popping up also in the West that about the financing that the cycling infrastructure should be paid by the cyclists, by the bikers, because the car infrastructure is paid by the or partly paid by the car owners. Did you have this kind of debate or conversation in Denmark or in Copenhagen? And how did you solve it? Or it's just not a topic. So the question was how, um, given that the car owners generate economic growth, then they have the right to uh, more space and uh, to get quicker from one end of the city to the other? Not exactly. That the car owners pay taxes yes. to build roads. Right. Car, but the bike owners, they don't pay any taxes for right. using the public spaces. And uh, there has been some debates popping up in Western countries also that this should change and the bikers should pay some taxes. So uh, I would say that any socioeconomic model, not only the one we have in Denmark, but 
the WHO has also made a European model called HEAT, and uh, the Dutch and the Swedes and many other countries have also made these monetary value units per kilometer. All of them shows that one kilometer driven by car costs society also when you calculate how many taxes car drivers and also, I mean, most citizens pay some taxes no matter what mode of transportation they use. So even pedestrians pay taxes, <laughs> but they're not necessarily dedicated taxes to build infrastructure. When you look at the monetary price of the surface area for car parked cars, and you compare it to how much it costs for residents to park their cars, I would say that you could describe it as public uh, funding for subsidies for car parking, because normally it will not go to zero. So uh, it's a very complex uh, picture who pays for what. But if you count in the air pollution, the congestion, we got CO2 emissions, the traffic accidents, etc. I think the, the net value would uh, be a good argument to invest more in cycling infrastructure. So I guess this has never been a big debate. It pops up from time to time, but then I okay. suppose. Yeah, you don't understand. <laughs> Thank you so much. Andreas. Uh, thank you. I am Andreas Lukas from the Clean Air Action Group, a Hungarian environmental NGO. And uh, my question in fact relates to this uh, question. Uh, as uh, you have shown, but as we all know, the, there is a huge external cost of. Uh, negative external cost of uh, car driving and a positive external cost of uh, cycling. So do you plan, uh, or is there any debate in internalizing these costs of driving of the, uh, for cars, for example, by road pricing, uh, congestion charging, uh, higher parking fees, or, or any way, and then if uh, the um, cyclists generate well, positive externalities, you should pay it. So is there any discussion about this? Yeah, the, there is a, an ongoing discussion in Denmark, both about congestion pricing and also about financial incentives to cycle more. Uh, it's regulated by the state. And at present, uh, there has been no government so far who is willing to either put in congestion pricing or you know, giving uh, financial bonuses for people cycling. Um, but who knows for the future? I know that a trial of congestion pricing will be put into place in, in the years to come. So sometimes it does take time, but it's not meaning that it will never happen. It needs to mature and the right moment politically will have to appear. And in Sweden and in Italy, I think the European Cyclist Federation has made a long list of countries where they actually make financial incentives to cycling. Good afternoon, my name is Chava Oros. I teach at Technical University of Budapest. Could you switch the computer to, to a slide with your figures about cycling in, in, in Copenhagen in 19... 46, 19, yes. 40, because I think it is a very interesting, a very interesting slide, and I think with your Hungarian colleagues, you could guess what is our what is our uh, year in in Budapest, because I think we are at about 2005, 2010, or something like that. This one. We, yes, I think this is very interesting. This should be published in Hungary. And when we are impatient or when we think about our position, as we have to admit that in history we are behind Denmark a little bit. About 150 years. Okay? So in cycling I think the difference is much smaller. I think we are we are under 36,000, but we have some increase. Okay? Uh, we had a lot of cycling before the Second World War, and then it's diminished according to German and Austrian 
France. So it, 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 it was not just because of our communist system, it was an international trend, and, and you also disappeared. So you went down to 8,000, so this is a social thing, and, and I think you are an expert in social sciences, but I have checked that you made about 15 short courses in the last 15 years, okay? So you are an honorary engineer. Thank you for your comment. I would like to ask, uh, you mentioned a campaign where uh, Danish people can, people of Copenhagen can eat their cake because they're, uh, they're cycling. So how did you choose the focus of your messaging? When, uh, when you when you when you created campaigns, uh, I want to know how did you what 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 was the the strategy that you you've chosen the groups and the messages and what, how how did you measure if it worked or not? So often when we talk to the Dutch cycle experts. They feel they have the better infrastructure, but we have the better marketing, and they always complain that we maybe have really big marketing budgets. We've never had big budgets for campaigns. It's <laughs> really small. But from the beginning, we chose to have a very clear strategy of the tone of voice, the way we wanted to communicate. So it's not that we had a lot of money to do city-wide big campaigns, but Every time we did communicate, we tried to be consistent. So also when we were informing about a road construction project, we were like, how do we want to communicate this? And so the logo, I bike Copenhagen with the bicycle as a symbol, was inspired by I Love New York. So we wanted to bring this fresh cosmopolitan sort of tone of voice and the heart was replaced by a bicycle. And the logo also signifies that it's the individual together with the city that makes up the cycling city. It's not only the public administration projects, it's the community of individuals together with the city. So we're all part of the cycling city. That's the message from that logo that we use every time we communicate. And then we had th three principles for our communication. We wanted to respect the citizens. So we might say, oh, this solution, it's really safe. There is no accidents here. But the citizens say, but it doesn't feel safe. I can feel the trucks just going past me. We need to respect their point of view when we communicate. Then we need to be positive. Like the example with the cake, we could make a health campaign saying, you will get diabetes if you don't bike. And then people will be like, oh. I'll just go home on the couch and watch Netflix. <laughs> um, so try to have this positive and humoristic approach. And the third one was to um, respect the diversity of the Copenhageners. So really not treat everyone like cyclists or motorists or whatever, but to know that Copenhageners are different and cyclists are different. And then we have tried to have this really casual tone. So on the footrests that you saw, we might have a streamer saying, Hi cyclists, thanks for cycling. It's really banal, but it's out there. It's not a campaign, you know, in the newspaper or in Facebook. But it's out in the real world where people are actually cycling. And then we, we do uh, evaluations. We do surveys afterwards to see if people discovered the campaign, do they feel the message is meaningful, has it changed their behavior, etc. It can be difficult to isolate the effect of a campaign when you also do infrastructural improvements. So what was the effect? Was it the bicycle track or the campaign? But we try to, to evaluate to see all the time if it makes sense for the end, end users. Azt hiszem, hogy van még mondjuk két kérdésre, és hogyha valaki még nem szólt hozzá idő, és utána én még vissza fogok jönni, és felteszek egy zárókört. Kükkő jelentkezett, aztán akkor Rádai Dani, és utána András. Ha még valakinek van, akkor, akkor gyorsan találja ki, és, és, és akkor még arra 
futunk egy kis időn. Kürti Gábor, vagyok Magyar Kerékpárstól, és hát két kérdésem van, az egyik az egy nagyon uh, rövid, hogy van egy de dedikált uh, kommunikációs költségvetés a Kopenhágai Városházán a kerékpározás népszerűsítésére. So no, there, we, don't, we don't have a communication budget as such. I, I tried to see all the investments we made over 10 years, how much of it was for campaigns or behavioral projects. And it was between one or two percent of all the money allocated to cycling. So it's, it's really small, the budgets. In Copenhagen, at least, the politicians, they prefer to invest in asphalt because they feel campaigns, it's too volatile. You cannot really show what's the permanent effect. We have other cities in Denmark, like the third largest city, Odense. They spend much more of their budgets on campaigns. We need to have some quality infrastructure before campaigns are really credible, else the citizens will go like, nice campaign, but <laughs> There is a truck killing me tomorrow, so please give me some basic infrastructure. But I think soft measures can be really helpful too. Because sometimes you can have really nice bicycle infrastructure, but you bought your car and it's really comfy and you, you need to, a little nudge to get outside of your car and find out that you, you can actually have a really nice experience also on a bike. So I would say you need a combination. A másik kérdésem pedig az lenne, hogy hát itt Budapesten nagyon példamutatónak tartjuk azt a két éves jelentést, ami a Kopenhágában minden második évben úgy tudom megszületik, és ennek a működése érdekelne, hogy van egy ilyen vezérdő pult, ami ennek a, ennek az, ezeknek az adatoknak a visszacsatolásról korrigál az irányon, például mondjuk, hogyha amikor ott voltunk, akkor éppen épült a metró 2010-ben talán, és most úgy hallottam, hogy a metró az egy kicsit betett, hogy hát visszavetette a kerékpározás, negatív hatása volt. Hogy ilyenkor újra terveznek, vagy jönnek ezek a két éves adatok, vagy hogy történik ez a városházán? So since 1995, we've been publishing this bicycle account every second year. Uh, it's, we just started with the data we had available and then slowly over time, we managed to put in the processes to collect, collect more and more data. So we have traffic counts from the city, we have a survey, we have traffic safety statistics, etc. Um, Then five years ago, the politicians, they wanted an annual report. They wanted a status of all the investments. Are they being implemented? What's the effect, etc. So we did that also for five years. And now that has transformed into a mobility report being published annually, where we don't only describe cycling, but also cars and walking and public transportation and, and electric cars and shared cars and micromobility. I think that's a really nice development that you actually get to see the whole picture. But we still have the bicycle account, which is of course important for the data, but also for the communication. So all along we've worked very strategically with using data as a way to present the good arguments in a credible and neutral way. Because often cycling can get really politicized, but the numbers, they often speak for themselves. And we find that it's, it's a good way also to communicate to the citizens. Um, the region of Copenhagen is now also doing bicycle accounts on a regional level, and they have made an interactive bicycle account that you can access, where you can you know, dive into the data more flexibly than you know, a PDF file or a printed publication. And I think the Danish government is also considering doing a similar thing on the national level. Just on the side note of this, if you go on the website of BKK, you will find uh, the interactive figures uh, of uh, not only cycling, but 
all kinds of mobility modes data uh, finally, uh, downloadable, uh, so that, that was also a step for us, but it's only the usage data now. The next step will be about infrastructure as well. The thing is, you have to know what data you to look for. If you have too much data, it can yeah. be a little overwhelming sometimes. Good evening. Uh, thanks, Mark, for being here and, and sharing generously. Um, I personally, I don't really like when we compare Copenhagen to Budapest and uh, vice versa because, well, as it's been said before also by professors, uh, there are a few centuries in between, so, um, yeah, like Paris, Frankfurt, Berlin, uh, some of these cities are a bit closer examples, but the main problem is, um, so, you were very diplomatic by saying how beautiful Budapest was, so thanks for that. Uh, but frankly speaking, we have some public spaces that are very Western-like, very decent-shaped, uh, very usable ones, and some that are beyond any kind of imagination with their disastrous and devastating state. Uh, let's be honest with that. Uh, obviously, it costs a fortune to figure these places out, so let's not uh, start with that. But uh, as it's been mentioned or so, um, the, the conversation starts with a political debate. So this whole topic became this, uh, this like ultimate issue of, okay, whichever politician or city leader talks about cyclists is an idiot. Uh, obviously the cycling state and people craving for a greener city believes that this conservative right-wing attitude about the city that's, uh, that's been in place for, I, I would say, more than a decade. Um, obviously that part thinks it's, this is an idiocy too. Um, so, in your experience, what are those tools that you experienced in the last years uh, of your career that helps decision makers taking a stand and making decision, for instance, removing a parking lane and placing a bicycle lane instead? Because this is the this like primary issue. For example, this, the municipality of Budapest, uh, via the transport company that Adam represents on the podium, uh, has just started making exemplary steps towards a network plan that starts figuring out, like filling the gaps and making a better network. But of course the question will be, will those decision makers and leaders uh, allow, allow these things to happen and these changes to happen? Because as you mentioned, and you partially answered my question before, uh, the campaign has to come after there are some steps uh, that gives uh, a safer possibility. And by infrastructure in that sense, I'm a huge fan and I practice tactical urbanism, so I don't really care about this. Let's pave everything differently and make a whole different world. Paris is showing what to do. Uh, Berlin is showing what to do, so I hope we can go in those directions. But I'm really curious, like with all of these debates, uh, what kind of particularly tools, if any, if possible, uh, you have in terms of figuring out this conflict. Uh, cheers. So, I have a really simple answer that will fix all the problems and convince all politicians to do No, <laughs> sorry, I don't. It's not as easy. Then we would see many more cities being uh, transformed for better cycling conditions because, as I showed, the socioeconomic argument is really clear. There are so many arguments, but it's not as easy as it is. I think in Copenhagen, what has helped also convince maybe some of the le less green politicians, who are not so radical, is sort of the more functional arguments about space optimization. It's not about saving the world or being like environmentalists, etc. It's just a matter of how many persons can you move through this street. The example of the Nørrebrogade, the highway I showed, and actually have 20% more people using that street, and that's good for businesses. It's not like a crazy uh, left-wing utopia, it's just efficient. That can be one way to try to sell your project and, and sort of clear it away from the more uh, ideological uh, connotations. But then again, the climate urgency, at least in Denmark, is bringing together politicians from all different political parties. So that can also be sort of an agenda to push forward. Air pollution can be really concerning if you really look into the figures of how detrimental it is to health 
and also to children's home and their learning capacities. And then sometimes it's, it's not the data and the figures because it becomes too abstract. It might be the good story about the local citizen whose daughter got into a traffic accident because she was actually cycling and it didn't feel safe. And then you get to feel the actual people who need the good solutions and you care for those citizens. So I don't have one solution to fix it, but I think the being ready to find the right argument for the right context and being versatile. Luckily, the cycling offers a lot of good arguments, so you can sort of pick your arguments wisely depending on the context. Do you have uh, any more questions? Okay, just keep it very short, please, because we are running out of time. Andes. Thank you. Uh, uh, would it be possible to receive your presentation? We, we just recorded it and, and then published it. Is it possible to share the slides? We will, we will see if we can find a way to share it. Um, Dolos? Thank you very much. Peter Dolos speaking at Center for Good of Transport. Hello. Um, Talking about communication, you, you mentioned uh, many times in your presentation the problems with the trucks, yeah, road dangers. Uh, have you tried the approach like uh, the Dutch tried some decades ago, talking about road dangers? And first of all, uh, groups like the young and the elderly. Is that a way in the communication, you think? Can you specify the, the question? Yeah, I'm talking about the campaign of the of the Dutch, the famous campaign of uh, Stop the Kinderman. Right. Was was that a were that a similar approach in in Copenhagen? No, we haven't had. So the Stop the Kinderman was a, a Dutch public movement, a little bit like the protests I showed here from Copenhagen, which was more based on environmentalism. But it was uh, parents who uh, protested in the streets because they were afraid the children were being killed in uh, traffic accidents. We don't have sort of a similarly well-organized public movement to protect the children, but uh, I think everyone is, of course, concerned about traffic accidents. Luckily, we have relatively few traffic accidents, but it, it still feels unsafe in some streets where we have a lot of car traffic, especially around schools. The data shows that we have almost no accidents with small children in the morning going to school. It's in the afternoon when the, when the older kids go by themselves to uh, leisure activities, that's where we see some accidents. But the parents, they are scared for the small children going to school in the morning. And we should take that seriously. There might not be any real accidents, but if they don't feel safe, they will use the car and drive the kids to school and then the other parents will feel unsafe from the parents choosing to drive by car. Uh, we have a last question here. Thanks, I'll try to keep it really short. So we are talking how cycling is available for everyone, even lower classes. And I think it's really important to mention that in most uh, suburban areas, there's a uh, large suburban suburbanization for financial reasons. So uh, lots of lower classes are basically moving away 20 or 30 kilometers from the city centers. And I think we always talk about Paris. In Paris, we can see that you know richer people live in the area. So my question shortly is, since there's a suburbanization based on like wages, how can you make it attractive for people to cycle who live like, yeah, especially so far away? Um, because promoting cycling, you know, it's true, but we can see that it's, it works really well only in the city center, so yeah, sure, that's the... So, smart urban planning is one way to approach it, <laughs> making sure that you just make monofunctional suburbs where people only live and they have to move far away to work or to shop or to go to school, but it takes time, and maybe when you do urban development you can Think smart from the beginning, but in the existing structure, it can be difficult to fix. Um, 
I think a combination of cycling and public transportation would be an answer if you have distances of 30, 40 kilometers. I don't think cycling is realistic for all families, for few families. But cycling to public transportation or maybe cycling on some of the trips, maybe not the commuter trips, but then errand trips, etc., can also for low-income families be a way to not spend too much money on transportation out of your daily budget. I saw a study from some Brazilian researchers <coughs> comparing how much money of your total income do you spend on transport, and then looking at families who had a travel distance where you could actually realistically use your bike, maybe up to 10 kilometers or so, and how much money would that free up from your daily budget. And for low-income families, that was a lot of money they could actually spend for other more important things. So we also have a responsibility to plan our cities so that it's dense and multifunctional, so you don't need those long distances. But I know it's not easy, but it should be a priority. Okay, we had uh, the really last question here. Thank you, and I think my question relates to your last words. You, you mentioned that the, the compacticity of the city and the 15 minutes uh, city concept is a really big story in some of the major uh, cities in Europe. And I'm not sure uh, what Copenhagen is doing in terms of reducing uh, traffic, and I mean uh, bringing services to uh, some, some parts of the city where people have to commute with car maybe. They shouldn't commute with car, but they do it. So how do you, what is your take on this story of 15 minute city? So uh, now working as a private consultant, we are working for the city for a new urban development area, very close to the city center. It's a former rail handling area of the Danish National Railways. And uh, they are constructing a whole new district there from scratch. And the aim of the city is that it should be car light. So you can only park your car in the periphery and some few car parking uh, houses, but not inside the district. There is no street level car parking. And the number of car parking spaces is much lower than in the, in the rest of the city. But then we plan for really good cycling facilities, walking, closeness to public transportation, etc. So that is one way to try to make it right from the start when you have that opportunity. And then, um, as I said, there will be a trial with the congestion pricing. We will lower traffic speeds. I mean, it's a multitude of uh, solutions. I don't think there's one fix quick fix, but we know the solutions, it's still not rocket science. Thank you very much for your questions. And I have the microphone now, so I can ask one more question here. Um, <coughs> one is that, were there any deadlocks or standstills in Copenhagen in this uh, development that had to be broken, and how, if there was any? There has been a lot of great knocks and standstills, and um, still is today. So one thing that we haven't really managed to do is when we renovate streets, then we put in bicycle tracks or widen the existing bicycle tracks, because it's much cheaper if you're digging up the whole street than to put in place the right uh, infrastructure. But the way it's financed, it's from another budget deal than the cycling projects. So it's really difficult to then change the layout of the street. So this is something that is still being worked on. Another example is one of the other very busy streets in Copenhagen where we have maybe 30,000 cyclists daily. And they have really, really narrow bicycle tracks. But it's connecting to a bridge crossing the harbor. So it's also a really important uh, connection for the car traffic and for the bus traffic. So there's just very little space, so what do we do? And it has been proposed several years for the politicians. Still no decision is being made, but uh, we will see in the years to come. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks everyone for staying here so late. Um, as a last round of questions to wrap it up, I would like to ask Ada and Adam, what are your main takeaways from, from this event? Well, I, I think we have to do a lot of things parallelly. That's what I. That's what I learned. Uh, building, planning, 
developing, but still it's a much cheaper uh, and lower cost, lower public cost uh, for the city to to organize uh, this this way of commu uh, commuting and, and mobility. And uh, as I'm a biker, I'm a cyclist. <laughs> and the toothbrusher as well, but uh, but yeah, because you know I am known as a cyclist in my society or or friends because it's just so not a common thing, or at least in my age, it's not really a common thing to do. So uh, yeah, but thank you for for sharing all these. Uh, Lessons, and thank you, Aaron, for for Thanks making for this happen as, as your first project, uh, part of uh, part of the climate and environment department. Uh, it's a, it's a great match, and uh, yeah, I'm happy that I could be here. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was a great presentation. Thanks a lot, and a great debate. Uh, I think it's always good to learn from those who are far ahead of us as well, and not only those who are close. And it's for me, a takeaway is that there is always a space for improvement. Uh, so, developing cycling is not something and objectives we achieve at a certain point. So, if Copenhagen still have big plans to improve, it means it's uh, there is even there, even there, there is a space to improve. We, we of course, should not think about this issue as a, a single uh, objective we would like to achieve. I think the other issue for me, which was very clear takeaway, the community involvement. Uh, I, I believe that's one of our biggest points here. So I was very curious to hear that how you involve the local uh, people, local population, and not only communicating via media, but being present on the street, on the road, and commun communicating with the directly affected people uh, very effectively. I think that's that's one takeaway for me, for sure, where we need to improve, uh, because I think at us, pretty much the engineering approach uh, was was the leading approach, which is not a bad approach. I'm not saying, I'm not criticizing the engineers. They know what to do, but in order to break, to have a breakthrough and to convince the people and to give the push, the, the tailwind uh, for the politicians instead of the headwind, we need to do that work as well. And I think that part of the job was seriously underestimated, uh, undervalued, and maybe still is. And I believe that's where we should invest more in order to create the critical mass, what other mentioned, to support for reallocating public space, because that's our biggest uh, battle, not the financial one, I'm pretty sure. And it takes time, it takes manpower, but not necessarily the big fancy budgets, but it needs staff to actually go around and, and do the dialogue, definitely. Can I come with last one final comment? Sure. I hope that I have created some images in your minds. I'm not expecting any other city to copy paste Copenhagen because we are good and also bad in some aspects, but I, I hope that this has been an inspiration and a motivation to keep enhancing Budapest in the way that makes sense here uh, for a customized solution here. And I look forward to discover the city tomorrow as well. Thank you for all your great questions. Thank you. Köszönjük szépen, hogy itt voltatok.